give you the best results. Hi, apparently we're recording. <laughs> Hi. Hi. All right, I'm making you host. There we go. Okay, it's working. Hi. Great. Hi. So today we're talking about grief. Um, and I am Bella Watson. I am a somatic movement therapist um, and dance teacher. And I like to playfully call myself a hardest, uh, which invibes what I do with its meaning to me. Um, and I'm with philosopher Bonnie Cohen today. So grateful for this opportunity to do this with you. And so I have a question before we even begin. Yeah. Um, what caused you to speak about or want to have a conversation about this topic today? I think it was you. I think we were <laughs> having uh, just one of our wonderful phone conversations. And you. I think you mentioned the idea about a field tank. And I'm like, oh, I want to do field tank Tuesdays. Um, and we were talking about the topics that we would like to talk about and grief came up and then addictions also came up, which is what we're planning to do next week. So yeah, you've just been dealing with a tremendous amount of grief and witnessing you move through it really wanted, made me want to talk about it because you understand grief on such a nuanced level that I don't know that most people do. So it, it's an interesting conversation to have with you because you know, I, I think that most people have a sense of what grief is and maybe they've experienced it to some degree, but you have like a PhD in grief. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, as do oh. I, and, but it, it makes for a conversation that we wouldn't be able to have, you know, in, in another way. And I think it's an important topic, especially in the time that we're in. In the time we're in, it is definitely um, here with us. So, um, well, before we begin, I really want to make sure that um, my divine intelligence is brought forth to speak on behalf of all being seen and unseen in my own process. So I'm just going to invite us to close our eyes down and take a few deep breaths mm -hmm. and expanding into our whatever we perceive as our core or seat of self and use cellular consciousness in our breathing, in our inhale to expand the width and depth of ourself. And on our exhale, just falling or yielding our body over the bony structures that we are. So as we inhale, we invite the unseen forces into our field. And as we exhale, we see ourselves back into the reality and our identity of what we think we are in this now moment. Hmm. Normally, this is a time where I would light some sage or turn on some music, but I'm away from my personal space today, but I'm injecting those words here because as we come to the table of grief, sometimes using our tools as marking points, as ceremonial moments allows us to reach further than the temporary state that we're in. So even just visualizing the burning of our favorite smells or incense, or maybe remembering the smell of those things can help us expand deeper and larger into time and space. Hmm. And then maybe opening our eyes and being here together, seeing what we see. So in order to prepare for this, I really wanted to get at the heart of what grief is defined as collectively. I think um, 
The power of words cast spells, hence spelling. And so I really wanted to understand what the collective conscious idea is around grief because I, I feel intuitively like I may hold a shifted perception on, of that being through so much grief and trauma in my lifetime. Um, so I'm just gonna offer some of the definitions that um, I've collected and maybe you'll want to write some down or let these inspire some words that might come um, either one by one or at the end, whatever bubbles up from you. Um, so one definition I read is that grief is deep sorrow, especially that caused by someone's death. And informally, it was also defined as trouble or annoyance. And um, I can really relate to the trouble or annoyance of it because it feels to me when the process of grief um, is incredibly annoying to me. I want to be in some other place than I am. And yet the perpetuation of these negative emotions seem to tumble me over um, greater than what I'm wanting to allow. And so I kind of took that definition and reframed it as grief is the process of releasing, re releasing pain. Yes. And I like to look at it as a process rather than um, an unchangeable situation or a, a state or a pinpoint of, of pain, but yeah. to recognize it actually as a, a, a cyclical pattern that is a process of releasing pain. And the pain that we feel is what I think we often call grief. Another definition is that grief is the normal and natural emotional reaction to loss or change of any kind. Of itself, grief is neither a pathological condition nor a personality disorder. Yeah. And what I love about that definition is that it allows us to um, be easy or forgiving on ourselves, which you have helped me so much with in my inner child work. Um, recognize that it's natural, that it is a normal and natural emotion. And I also appreciate about this definition that it separates it from it being a pathological condition or a personality disorder. Um, but the questions that I have that come up about it is when does that cross over into that, um, that land of acknowledging it as um, being pathological and the only thing to me that would um, classify it as such would be a, a, a pattern of time, like an endurance of time yeah. staying in this condition that then makes it pathological. So then the big question is like, well, how much time is acceptable for me to grieve in this process of relieving, releasing my pain um, before it turns into um, a condition or a disorder of some kind? And I think that, you know, um, depression would be a state that takes over where we no longer have the ability to consciously be present in our process of releasing the pain and become victim to that pain. Yeah. Do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I feel like um, speaking to just that little point of the, the way I talk about grief is it's something to move through. Um, and so if we get to the point where we're not moving through it and we've decided to stay there and, you know, pull up a, you know, pull up a blanket and make a blanket fort in the middle of it and refuse to leave, um, that's a place that's, that's a reasonable place to be when the, when the stimulus is, is recent. Um, but if the stimulus has has passed a very long time ago and we're still sitting in that place and we're picking at things to keep it alive. You know, we're making something stay alive that is long gone. Um, that's when it starts to become pathological. And that's when it turns into depression when you just don't move through it. And we don't move through things because we don't have the set and setting to do the work because we don't have somebody to sit next to us in our blanket fort while we cry or hold us while we cry or, you know, whatever, if we don't have the spaciousness 
to move through it. And if we've never, if nobody's ever shown us how to move through it, you know, if as children, you know, we lose our favorite toy and instead of somebody empathizing with us, we're told to just get over it. How does a child get over something that they have attached to them? You know, when something is attached to who we think we are and we no longer have access to it, grief is what happens. So, um, yeah. That's... Yeah, and I think you're really hitting on the core of this topic, which for me and my perception and what I perceive might be different than most is that um, what is being thwarted in the grieving process is the loss of our own identity. And so I like to delineate these, um, the feeling of loss or sorrow uh, or longing for someone um, separately, I like to detangle those from the process of grief, because grief to me is the normal and natural reaction to that loss of attachment or bond yes. in, that we have become familiarized with to in an uncertain world, we have this touchstone in another person or a place or an idea even um, that is part of our identity that says in this uncertain world, there is this certainty here. Mm -hmm. And when that certainty is removed, then the, th the, the thing that's really happening is a re-identification process of self without that um, touchstone, without that solid, seemingly solid um, positionality that we once had with that attachment or that bond. And so there is the process of grief, of, um, of sorrow, of missing the thing. And then there's the actual process of moving through it, as you say, where we, we are in charge and actually being called to become the responsible ones of finding new touchstones and placing our faith in that. And so oftentimes when we are in the process of sorrow, um, we can't do that work by ourselves. And, and there, while there is work to be done um, by ourselves to acknowledging what things might help us um, to know how to shift our energies, it is simply something that can't be done alone. And I think that that's where it then becomes pathological when we um, do not create new moments to form new attachments and bonds. And a, a big part of the spiritual community is saying non-attachment, non-attachment. And while the um, process of grief is recognizing that we can no longer be attached to that thing, I think the great disservice in a lot of the spiritual communities of, of holding high praise to non-attachment is by shaming the fact that we need bonds and attachments when that's absolutely what we need. Um, and that is why the sorrow is being felt. So in order to move through it, we need to find other points of attachment and other places to bond our energy so that we can still find a positionality of belonging. Yeah. Without well, that, we are depressed. <laughs> without that, what did you say? without that attachment or bonding, we are depressed. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, a, a lot of the community that you're talking about uses non-attachment as spiritual bypass. So I think that's yeah. what you're touching on. Yeah, which, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're a puddle on the, you know, wrapped up in blankets and you're not <laughs> capable of doing anything and you don't have the set, the set and setting, you don't have the spaciousness and you don't have the support and you don't have all that, using non-attachment as a coping mechanism so that you can get through it so that you can get yourself up off the floor and become, you know, a productive member of society because that's what's valued in whatever. Um, you know, it, there, there's nothing wrong with that except that it doesn't get the work done. You know, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't I think it's both, you know, it's recognizing, you know, uh, another definition I was working around today. It's, I wrote that grief simply means the acknowledgement of losing part of our identity. And so that's the recognizing of non-attachment. Yeah. Um, I went on to say, it's a matter of having to face that life is uncertain, but that death and loss are certain. It makes us reckon with our own mortality and the million tiny deaths embedded in the process of life. Yeah. We acknowledge an attachment or bond to someone, something, or somewhere that will no longer provide us security, comfort, and belonging. Grief says, I'm no longer who or what I was, and now I'm forced to change in order to continue on. 
It commands us to find new touchstones to cope with the complexities of being a human life. So in other words, it's bring, we must acknowledge non-attachment as part of the, the life process will have deaths. Mm-hmm. And then the, the new, the process of overcoming the process, the grief part of it is saying, I accept new life. And so the spiritual bypass is it's only stopping short. It's not that we shouldn't acknowledge non-attachment. It's that we have to face non-attachment over and over and over again. And that the thing that helps build new life is finding new attachments. It's not to be unattached and without anything, but to consciously shape new attachments that are in the directionality of our new um, blossoming or new identity or new growth or new recognition, recognition of self. And I, I think that living in a non-attached way is a, valid, is a valid way of walking through the world. It's just not a very rich way. There's not, yes. there's not a lot of depth to it. There's not a lot of, you know, there's something about the experience of becoming in, attached, about becoming, you know, saying someone is, is my beloved. You know, once you say my, you're attaching yourself to the thing and living a life where you don't ever do that is, is a life, but it, it doesn't have, I don't know. It doesn't have all the yum. I think, I think that the yuck comes with the yum, you know? Absolutely. (laughs) They are co um, co travelers. (laughs) It's part of the whole of, of the experience of it. Yeah. You speak so eloquently about it. Mm, Well, you know, I think that so many of us think about grief as the loss of a person. And the older I get, the more people I lose. Um, I lost seven people in the last six weeks. And, you know, it is about the people. But the loss of them, when I think about them, I'm almost kind of jealous of them. It's like, oh, you're done. You don't have to do this difficult lifing thing anymore. So what I'm left with is the difficulty of me continuing to go on without them. And as I excavate what I'm really sad about, it reminds me that actually I've been doing grief work all along. Um, So in my personal history, um, you know, I had some near death experiences where I had to face leaving this life in a, once you're in the near-death experience, I, from everything that I've read, my, mine were my own as each of us are, each of us that have had them are. Um, But for me, I had to recognize in this other space um, that this, this attachment that we're letting go of is just the physical part of the body but that our consciousness is still um, permeating the experience. And we call them near death for a reason. I can't claim to say that I was fully dead. I know that I left my body for some time um, in in each of those circumstances. And so the process of those near death experiences was incredibly, that was the most grief. And that's how I come to relate to grief now is that it is actually not about the other person. It's about what I'm going to do now without this thing that was my attachment. And for me in that instance, it was my first greatest grief was losing physical ability. And so disability in general is um, a process that is full of grief. And then the older I get, um, aging is this perpetual grieving process that there's no end date to when I'm going to be done with it. And that's why I think it's so fascinating that we look at people who have experienced trauma um, and even going through therapy, when is the checked off day that we get to check the box that says, I'm done with that now? Um, especially with aging, it's coming as fast as we are going. And so there is a constant piece of our pie that is devoted to grief. And I think that in general, humans think I lose someone, I grieve, now I'm over it. And it is not that linear. Um, I lost someone in my childhood that 
in, in my young adulthood that was my favorite person on this planet. And, uh, and initially I dealt with her death very gracefully because I had just had near death experiences. And so I, my intellectual self believed that she was in a better place and I could actually sense and feel her closer to me than when she was in the body. But years later, the um, not having her here to seek counsel with in tender moments when I felt that only she would have the answers that I was looking for and be able to deliver them to me in just the nuanced way that I would understand and feel deeply connected to, she wasn't here to give them to me. And so I felt a lot of grief over the fact that I had to invent her way of um, responding or her advice to me. Um, but that grief is still not as great as the grief as it was of losing my career as a young, talented dancer who had her whole life ahead of her with a very promising future. And then, you know, to have a tumor in my foot and be in a wheelchair for a year and a half and lose my life that I had spent sculpting every day since I was three years old, yeah. to lose my identity of self to that degree was the greatest grief that I've known. And I still experience it um, as I see colleagues of mine being so successful in this career and I'm not there. There is still a tiny part of me that grieves that. And um, I've learned how to um, section off a ceremony of this process of releasing pain because the pain doesn't end, it's actually the opportunity that I invite when I recognize that the pain is there, that I can actually honor the grief that is present. I can honor the thing that I'm letting go. And I've faced so much grief in my life now that I hesitate to say this because it's always like, the deeper I go into my own understanding, I simultaneously stand to alienate myself from the, those in which I wish to belong. And so this statement might be something that would alienate me. Now, when something really unfortunate happens that brings grief to the present, I, I have an undertow of almost giddiness over it because it means to me, wow, I didn't want this to happen now. I wasn't expecting it now. I didn't call it in and yet it's here, which means there's only one thing that's going to happen. I'm about to transform exponentially once more. And I've begun to look at that process as like, ooh, goody, I can't wait to see who I am on the other side of this one. <laughs> but most people when they're in the state of grief um, are, are practicing a, pat, a, a pattern of thought that secludes them into being totally encompassed by that sense of loss of identity. And no one else can tell us when we're ready to start claiming life again. Yeah. But one picture that helps me be eloquent with my words and in the process of it is that I like to visualize my um, emotional life as a pie. And so the pieces of the pie are like the time clock of my day that is my daily thoughts. So if I could go back and look at yesterday, for example, and how frequently I was thinking thoughts that brought me a sense of joy or thinking thoughts that brought me a sense of gloom or thinking thoughts that brought me a sense of hope or thinking thoughts that were self-loving. Um, and I was able to really no one is capable of doing this, maybe monks that are in caves somewhere to be able to hold this much concentration to name and, and segment them. But if we were capable of doing it, then you know all of those pieces of pie would be very telling to us about where we're putting our mental energy. Mm -hmm. But when, when loss initially happens, it's with seemingly without our permission that our thoughts go into the cyclical nature of repeating the, the pain, repeating the pain, repeating the pain, repeating the pain. So for example, a couple of weeks ago when I lost my ex-husband, um, who was a very defining person in who I am in this life, we were together, we loved each other, 
rather for 20 years. And we met when we were still in high school. And so my identity was very much shaped and formed by the we-ness of us. And, um, and so as I was processing his death, I would just be going about my normal um, life and a memory would come up or the fact that he was gone would come up. And in that particular instance, um, a lot of the negativity that we faced together that ultimately ended his life um, was, it, it brought other negative emotions that were entangled into that grief with it, like regret. And so I had to really differentiate in this pie thing, okay, I had this thought about regret, that's actually not grief, that's regret. Or um, the fact that I will never see him again or hear his laugh or, or hear his jokes, that that's actually sorrow, that's not actually grief. But grief is our own personal process with letting go of those attachments and what our, how our identity is being affected by that loss. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> and it makes sense with the way that our, like, that our brain pathways work also, because if you, if one little thing touches on a thing that then comes up to be cleared and everything that's attached to it also comes up to be resorted and to be reorganized. And it's the way that the neuro pathways actually work that like have that be like that. And the more that we understand that, the easier it is for us to cope with. Because we understand that it's like, these thoughts aren't coming up to punish us. They're not coming up to hurt us. They're coming up to be cleared and to be resorted. Um, yeah, you speak very eloquently about the experience of it. Yeah. Yeah, what I've been studying most recently is, um, I, I always ask myself this, it's strange, but I'm like, why do I dance? Like, why is this of all the fields that there are that I'm interested in? Um, why is it dancing that is just captivates me? And the new research that I'm doing is on uh, the neurobiology of thought and how um, our identity is measured in these plexuses of memory and how when we were shaped, um, the nerve endings kind of encapsulate experiences that define people, places, and things as part of our identity. Um, but that that movement is um, the absolute only way to recreate new neural pathways. And so it makes sense to me um, that all learning is movement. It is how we adapted to our environment, what we looked at, where we um, spent our focus and our time, how we moved in a facilitating environment shapes our body. A runner has a very different body than a, 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 a golfer, just speaking in terms of athletics, mm -hmm. um, has a very different body than a swimmer, mm -hmm. um, has a very different body than a person in a wheelchair. And so the way that we're moving or our limited movement um, physically shapes our body and our mind is not separate than that. And so therefore the two are interplayed. Mm -hmm. And so I think the reason I love dancing so much is because it has absolutely let me transcend grief. For sure. Yeah. It, it's, it, a, it's the new learning in the yeah. physical body that allows my thoughts to um, sure. reclaim new life. Yeah, for sure. And I think that ultimately that's the whole reason that I'm a dancer. And then all yeah. of the various pathways that it was shaped in because of our culture, whether that be the high art or now through movement therapy, um, even calling it movement therapy or teaching classes on it, it just feels so counterintuitive to actually the kind of enriching um, ecosomatic journeys that I would choose to take people on where we're actually um, building an earthen landscape or tending to our garden and then using the breath and our thoughts in that movement. That is actually how I feel like what the definition of dance is. Yeah. It is the, the movement that we take as we're shaping our inside world to the outside world. Um, but 
movement in general is, I think, the reason I have navigated so many unfortunate circumstances um, has been my lifesaver. Yeah. Any way that you can move energy like that, I think, is a, a conduit for really being able to do the work effectively. And I think one of the things you're speaking to about the teaching it, you know, we live in a world where the child is pounding on the floor, you know, in anger and, you know, processing emotions by, you know, like really moving their physical energy and they're, they're picked up and they're held or they're told to go to their room and read whatever, you know, they're not, we're not engaging with children in a way where it's clear that they're having things that are coming up to be cleared. And so we cut that off and then you have to go teach classes to get people to reconnect to it. Um, that's why it feels so unnatural because it is. So, yeah. Yeah, and the, um, on, that, on that wavelength, um, you know, I, I read something years ago that's so fascinating to me that seems to be with me every week since I read it. And it was, uh, a group of experiments that were done with um, uh, three, four, and five-year-olds. And they were observing the breath, which in the somatics world is the fundamental movement pattern. There are six main patterns, um, eight in some, in some schools of thought. Um, but breath is the first in all schools of thought. And so they were watching the breath pattern and around the age of five, it changed and it was directly linked to emotion. And this was the experiment. They would have um, the child enter a space where there was an adult there who would point and laugh at them, hmm. like point and laugh. And the three-year-olds giggled with them. La ha ha, we're laughing, great. The four-year-olds would giggle and laugh with them. And the breath patterns of those who could giggle along with those that were pointing and laughing was all lower belly breathing. And mm -hmm. if you've ever seen a baby like in a crib napping, um, their lower belly bulges out and, and, and then closes again. And that is the most natural movement pattern of the breath that there is. But around the age of five, when they would laugh and point, the five-year-old would feel shame and would cower and hide or become sad because they had noticed then that they were separate than others. So with the three and four-year-olds, one person is laughing and pointing. They thought that they were also laughing and pointing. That's what we do. We are laughing and pointing. But by age five, the separation between self and other had become such that that gesture and that laughing um, then meant something about them that separated them. And when they studied the breath of those specific children, unanimously, they no longer lower belly breathed. Mm. I bet they it held was, their breath too. It was caught in the chest yeah, and it was exactly. only up and down. Yeah. And so as a somatic movement, um, helper, um, we like to um, condition people to come back to that natural breathing. And the interesting thing is that the, as soon as the thought goes out, instead of being consciously in the present, then the breathing stops. Mm. And so I giggle that I'm just trying to bring people back to their three and four-year-old selves. Mm. And the thing that reminded me of that, of what you were talking is that as children, society allows um, little ones to physically express their emotions, which somatically gets it out of the way so that they can move forward to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But as adults, we are enculturated into this experience of keeping a still face, not expressing too much, mm -hmm. um, definitely not allowing the body to move um, because of what it might say about you. And in particular, um, men really face a lot of shame about moving and women face shame about moving if it is not sexual. Mm. And so there is such a severed opportunity to move, literally move through grief because of the enculturated stance that moving the body in any way that is non-sexual should be seen as shaming. And then furthermore, 
for the women, um, when it gets to the sexual place, then if you move it too sexually, then there's a limit on it. And it all depends on the audience that you're in that tells you whether or not you're allowed to express. So most of the time we, sh we condense our physical selves into this containment that then if we're experiencing grief and we can't move, then we become stagnant and depression begins to, to create the, um, you know, the groove that we just keep going back to because yeah. there's nothing outside of that. And Cancer so, don't let ourselves. Yeah. 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 And so um, I was creating, you know, this kind of list. I like to think about grief in two ways. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. I do my own work on it. But if I was to like create categories for others, of course, it all comes from direct experience. But this, um, if I was to delineate the two sides of living in the process of grief in order to go through it and then the recovery from grief as being the active solution oriented um, consciousness that helps us keep moving toward it and that in the yin yang of that kind of like the inhale and the exhale where the inhale says oh it is present I am in it I am feeling these things I am sensing these things and the exhale of okay, what can I let go in my identity so that as I take my next inhale, it is consciously moving in a direction that's towards moving through it or claiming new life or claiming new identity. And I was just playing around with like um, um, tools that I use in those ways. But before I move into tools, I just like was wondering if there's any other... Um, definition or ideas around kind of quantifying grief that that you have that we might tie some loose ends around or or have conversation around yeah um we can touch on that but i think what i wanted to ask to sum up what you were just talking about is um the act of moving through grief is it is it holding these thought forms that are coming up to be cleared and breathing at the same time. Like, is that really all it's about is just experiencing what there is to experience and having natural breath at the same time? Is that like a good way of describing it? Well, I don't think that it's possible to do anything at the same time. Okay. It, it's actually been scientifically proven. And so what I would then say is that that is an undulating back and forthness okay. of recognizing um, whatever the thought is that's coming up that that is creating the emotional experience and then bouncing to holding that it, with consciousness of the breath and then maybe going back to the thought and then using the breath. And we're able to do that so fast naturally that we think that it's at the same time but we can't, we can't actually be consciously breathing if we are conscious about another thought. We're rapidly bouncing back and forth between the two. It's just happening, happening so quickly. Like, sure. I think that the, the first place that I saw this, maybe I could be wrong, was on Mythbusters, but they were trying to like prove whether or not um, um, multitasking was possible yeah and it's not it's impossible it's just that the people who say i'm a great multitasker it just means that they're able to place their conscious attention rapidly from one place to another one place to the another, one place to the other and i think inevitably the feeling of grief is like such a weighted blanket that it disables us from going rapidly. And so actually the process of grief is choosing to step out of it for a moment. And it's not to step aside of our grief of losing the person, but to actually step more into ourself of the here and now again. And then the thought comes and the emotion comes and then, yes, I'm inhaling, recognizing that I had that thought and now I'm consciously exhaling and then whatever comes next is there. And yeah. so it, it's this rapid undulation of back and forthness. And that is the dance. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I wonder if I wonder if it's possible to cultivate an automatic way of breathing 
that is um, that natural belly breathing that doesn't require any conscious thought where you can have your consciousness on the experience and have the breath be natural and automatic as opposed to be, you know, it's like um, they talk about fear being excitement without the breath, you know, like, you know, fear is like, there's an, a feeling of excitedness, but I'm holding my breath about it, you know? Um, and so excitement then would be that feeling without the stopping of the breath, kind of. So we're talking about the same thing, just from different, like, different. Well, levels. and I love what you said, and I would love to continue to hold that curiosity um, that maybe we would be mastered if that was possible. Yes. And, and I'll say, like, yeah. as a yoga teacher, um, when I put students into shavasana i'm looking for their natural belly breathing and that's how i know they've gone into the field and as soon as i see their breath change i know they're back into thoughts mm -hmm. and that's when i will cue them to come back into the relaxation of their body or the practice of accepting death as a practice of non-doing of non-being of non-identity but letting the whole infrastructure of the uh, machine of the body quiet back down. And then their natural belly breath starts again. And then I can tell when they go into thoughts because it goes shallow again. Yeah. And the lower belly doesn't breathe. But I love your question of curiosity because that seems like that question would expand every field into a healthier direction if the first fundamental movement pattern was entwined with the art of what it is that they're doing. Yes. Yeah. And I think that may be the, you know, the unattachment folks that may be where they're heading to that kind of, you know, that's what they're looking for. And I think that's the goal of meditation, right? Maybe. Yeah. But so often we say in the States anyway, that we are practicing meditation when actually what we're practicing is concentration. Meditation is something that happens to us. It is no longer what you're saying. The automaticness yeah. is present. And so it's not something that we're choosing. And until the automaticness is there, we are actively choosing it. And so in the eight, in the, um, in the eight limbs of yoga, concentration comes before meditation. Makes sense. And yeah. so frequently we, I mean, we talk about meditation as if that's what there, all there is to do when th we might actually achieve meditation, like a tiny fraction of the time. Right. And all the rest is actually concentration because we're having to direct the experience because it's not happening automatically where Samadhi is the state that it is natural. And for any of those that follow the yogic practice or Zen practices, the naturalness of being in bliss without attachment is sometimes people reach for it their whole life and never experience it. I think probably the act of reaching for it blocks it, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's that coming and going without the practice of it, which is the act of reaching for it, we would never get there, but it's the ability to reach for it and then let go of it, reach for it, then let go of it, reach for it, let go of it. And that's that coming and goingness. I think that is the, that is the dance. Indeed. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was super distracted for a second. A bird just landed on my, my window screen and it was <laughs> walking up my window screen, kind of looking at me like, what are you talking about over there? It mm. was, that was pretty cool. <laughs> mm, I love that that just happened because it reminds me, um, the hummingbird is, um, people often revere the hummingbird as um, this beautiful fifth dimensional um, character that is expanded beyond. And what I want to say is that, you know, every night they go into torpor, which is um, hibernation oh. in the bird world. In order to experience more life, they have to put themselves into almost death. And I think that it is that state that I am exactly, I'm exactly trying to articulate right now of they're coming and going in the day, they have to find food and then they have to stop and then they have to find food and then they have to stop. And it's that 
duality that is creating their um, single point of focus into this suckling of life's fruit and, and nectar and then resting. And if they were only ever looking for this, they would become so exhausted that they, they would die. And if they were only at rest, they would not have enough sustenance and they would die. And if they kept themselves awake during the night, it would be too cold for their tiny body and they would die. But they've learned how to go to both ends of the continuum through their waking life of the day and at nighttime. And, it, and with the hummingbird, it's just, oh, one just chirped above my head. <laughs> tweet, tweet, tweet. I love that. Um, um, it's that coming and goingness, I think, that really makes the hummingbird this like extreme example of what it is that we're talking about. Yeah, it sounds like it. It also makes me wonder like what would happen if we somehow through science invented the perfect nourishment for a hummingbird that gave them sustained energy and they didn't have to always be suckling looking for the nectar, like what they do with their lives. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if it's possible. I mean, we're animals, right? That's like as creatures of this planet without our permission even, there is a natural thing that we must do every day, which is find the nourishment. Yeah. I mean, in a thought experiment though, you can imagine it being possible that totally. you could spend 10 or 15 minutes of your day getting all the nourishment you need and then having the whole rest of the day free. So it's possible. And, and what would we do with that, you know? Exactly. I wonder that all the time about animals, like, you know, squirrels, you know, squirrels spend a lot of time playing because they don't, you know, nuts or give you sustained energy. You know, the things that squirrels eat give you sustained energy. They have plenty of time to play. You know, hummingbirds, what they get doesn't give them sustained energy. It gives them little bursts of energy and they have very different lives because of it. That's for sure. Yeah. And perhaps, you know, just as a question of curiosity, you know, maybe that is what human consciousness and our seeming difference from the animal world, maybe that's what we're trying to figure out is like, if we weren't needing to constantly struggle for getting our needs met, what is it that we would do? I mean, I think that's part of what art is all about. I think about this often. If we were just like living in community where all of our needs were met effortlessly, what would be possible for us for humanity? You know, and there's intentional communities that are dedicated to finding that out. Dom and her in Italy is one of them. You know, like that's what they investigate is what's possible for humans once all your basic needs are met, you know, yeah. and the mysteries that are available. It's, it, it's, I feel like, I feel like we, we are playing the beginning of a video game where you're just sort of like learning how to get your basic needs met in the beginning of the video game. And then there's like a gummy ship that takes you to some other realm that lets you, you know, interact on a whole like topsy-turvy world. And <laughs> you just have no, you, you couldn't possibly understand from the perspective that you have at the beginning of the game. And I feel that's very much what humanity is at right now. You know, um, and collectively, we just don't have any idea what's possible when we sit together and process all this grief. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the separation, a lot of the the fighting, a lot of the wars. It, it's all grief that's unprocessed, that we've we've dressed up as culture, and that we've, you know, created myths about, and that we live in the myth of. And it's really just there's so much grief here there's so much grief here to move through. Yeah, I was um, making a list of the things that cause me grief. And what you're saying is touching on one of those. And, and we've already talked about a couple of them, disability and aging in general. Um, and another one for me was not being able to have children. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like this, you know, enculturated view that because I'm a woman, I'm missing out by not having children. And I never really perceived it that way until someone told me that I couldn't have them any longer, uh -huh. um, that my window had passed. And, and then there was tremendous grief of like, I never even got to peek under that um, to even know 
uh, I kind of tricked myself and fooled myself that I had enough time and then time was gone. And so I don't even know. Um, and then the, the main thing that brings me grief right now is the death that the earth is experiencing by human hands, which I think brings me to the, the last one of grief, which is something that plagues me every day. And I think that it's difficult for me to not get into depression about it but it is specifically living in a capitalistic environment where the need to use all of my life force on a daily basis to simply afford to stay alive in the culture that I am in disallows every special thing that, that I can imagine that being a human life would be worth it for. And so in my own mastering of my own life I ever try to entwine those two together and that's why I become became a dance teacher and um, why I continue my research into other fields and its entanglement with dance and movement specifically um, but you know capitalism we have come to agree culturally that that's just the way it is so much so that if you don't subscribe to it, then there's a lot of names that are called and your worth as a human being is diminished. When I have lived in situations because of my own disability where and my own healing process where I was not part of the capitalistic America by any stretch, you know, living off the land uh, very humbly um, and was able to access the unseen more intuitive, sensing-oriented ways of uh, existing in a body than the capitalistic structure ever allows me time to marinate and, and nurture myself in, which to me is actually the non-capitalistic way of going through life is the yummy, juicy morsel whole point of getting to be excited about being a human being that is conscious yeah. and, and, and capitalism. capitalism enforces us to go back to being an animal where all of our resources are not just for self but because of the way the tax system works and everything else is going to serve this bigger picture and I, I don't mean to um, call myself anything other than just someone who's noticing that I don't have another structure to replace capitalism that I think is infallible. I just am noticing the disservice that it has brought to my own life and constantly entraps me in grief, which we socially accept as just the way that it is. Yeah, under capitalism, that yum is only dessert. There's, there's, you know, only a very few privileged people get to be in capitalism with yum being their entire day. They just happen yeah. to have interests that are inherently monetizable well, you know. Um, and there are ways of organizing ourselves where everything is based on the yum, you know, where collectively we are looking for the win-wins where we're dwelling in yum all the time. It's, it's, just, as, it's just as logical, you know, to, to live Absolutely. that way, if not more logical. But I hear what you're saying. I have spent a tremendous amount of time over the last 10 years not being able to participate fully in the capitalistic game, or 20 years really, because of you know disability also. Um, and I'm sort of like half in the world, half out of it. You know, I've but I I was really reflecting today, like my my capabilities of a day are like maybe two calls like this. You know, like that's how much of my life force I can give to being outside of my own self-care. You know, I need a tremendous amount of time to keep myself healthy and calm and balanced and doing my work so that I can show up. And uh, it, there's not enough room in, in the way we have things built for, for people to do radical self-care, you know, and self-respectful self-care. That's my current mantra, self-respectful self-care. And if everybody could do self-respectful self-care what would the world look like yes yeah you've really touched on something there I think you know last year when I was having a tremendous difficulty grieving the loss of someone that was you know still alive and I think that most of the time those losses the, those griefs are 
so much deeper than someone just passing away because when someone dies, it's not personal, <laughs> but when you lose someone who's still alive, oh man, it's so personal and it, and it touches those identities. But, you know, you and I were talking uh, back then about, you know, being ever reverent for this inner child who's ne needing to have these experiences and not shame or guilt her or tell, be tough loving about it. And, you know, I thought it was all about self-love through all these years through therapy and, and coaching and group workshopping and everything that I've done is like this self-love, self-love. And as much as I'm practicing, I constantly ask, what is love? Like, what is self-love? What does that even mean? And my, my turning point was when it was, I changed love for respect. And it was like, what is self-respect? Well, I know exactly what it means to respect others. And where am I not respecting myself? Whether that be my inner child or my inner adult or my inner sage or my inner poet or my inner artist or um, any of those fractals of my personality or ways that I perceive myself. Am I holding respect for any of the, uh, for those positions? And how frequently am I offering respect reverently? Yeah, like it's like love is who we are and what we are and like what all this is, is love. And that the things that block our having self-respect take us out of that. That was so beautifully said. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 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 We, and, we and all are of this, already love. Yeah, exactly. So like we can't really identify what self-love is. We only know what it, we only know when it's blocked. We know what the experience of, of not self-love is, you know, but it makes sense that it would be really difficult to like wrap your brain around what self-love feels like, you know, but self-respect does have, you know, you know when it's there and you know when it's not. And I know when I'm doing self-respectful self-care and it looks different all the time. Sometimes self-respectful self-care is going to get, you know, takeout. And sometimes self-respectful self-care is spending two hours making myself food. You know, it's just, it depends on, on where I am and what my needs are at the time. But, you know, it's easy to convince yourself that you're doing something out of love. It's harder to convince yourself that you're doing something out of respect. You know, it's like, mm. there's less room for self-delusion there too, so. Mm. Yeah. Well, kind of closing this, um topic, I would love to keep going in the direction that we're talking about and, and breach the subject of um, things that we can do that are either the process of overcoming grief or claiming new life or this yummy um, go, getting back to a state of yum or self-care. And so maybe we could just ping pong back and forth between each other of, of things that we do um, that shows our self-respect or self-care um, so that future listeners or future versions of ourselves that come back and watch this um, yeah. remember the centered place that we were in at this time and maybe use some of those tools at a later date um, yeah. just to help others who might be in the overwhelming process of grief to start to choose new life and yeah. so I'm going to start with what you just said and and how we started this which um, eating sweets and comfort foods or making recipes by loved ones that are lost um, seem to help me when I'm in the critical chronic place of, okay, I don't even know how to get out of this right now. It is with me and I, it's not, it's not the right time to start trying to build the, rebuild myself at this moment. Right now is the time that I'm dwelling in it. So for example, the day after I found out um, my ex-husband had passed, I could hear my grandmother's voice telling me, there's nothing that a pint of ice cream can't solve. And I did not want to cook for myself. And had I been able to be home with family, um, you know, the meals that were being shared and passed between them, I wouldn't have had to cook for myself. But being in this capitalistic society and still needing to go to work like 10 to 12 hours a day, my normal routine of in my break time, cooking and preparing and washing the dishes and doing everything to get back to work to do it again, that was not possible. And I didn't want to cook anything, nor did I want to go out into public because I was a crying mess. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and then sitting somewhere by myself in that state only brought about the grief more. So I went and bought myself a tub of ice cream and I ate it until it was gone over the next couple of days. And I was able to quantify that big tub of ice cream into um, every bite I'm taking of this is to respect the loss that I'm feeling and mm -hmm. respect myself that I don't need to search for better feeling thoughts or fixing or repairing myself right now. It's actually to take the most soothing thing and give it to myself because I don't need to do anything else right now. That's it. It's just soothe myself. And I found it in ice cream. And mm -hmm. of course I put on weight and my tummy digestion got upset and, and all of those things. And then my self-care was different in that, but I was at a different emotional place to then go back to the regular eating and diet and nutrition things that I do to take care of my full self. But initially it was, I always noticed that like eating sweets is the best way to supercharge me to be ready for whatever difficult lies ahead. Yeah. Well, being in grief will, um, will stimulate production of cortisol and then eating sweets. Like you can't digest sweets when your body's full of cortisol, I guess. I'm not a biologist, I'm a philosopher, but, um, <laughs> but, but the gist is that when your body's full of sugar, you're not full of cortisol. So it's like, there's like a natural thing there. Um, and I think that the key is to find ways of, find tools, find coping mechanisms that do as little damage to us as possible. So you went and found ice cream. You didn't eat like, you know, 500 candy bars. You didn't go do, you know, a drug that messes with your brain, you know, or, you know, meth or heroin or something like that. That would, you know, and then I have a master's in social work. So I look for harm reduction, you know? So for me personally, I know that I can't eat a tub of ice cream. I'd get pretty sick. So I would eat popcorn. You know, and the thing about popcorn is that you can only eat so much of it at a time because you can't just like shove it in your face. You have to eat, right? And you can, but you can't do that for very long, right? So for me, it's finding something that I can do that is not outside of self-respectful self-care. It may not be fully inside of it, but it's not outside of it. And that's- yeah. Yeah. And I really quantified it to when the tub of that ice cream was done would be the time when I started searching for new tools to move me into um, new bonds, new attachments, um, making a plan for my recovery, because that is what grief is about. It's like, oh, I'm in it. Oh, I'm losing it. Yes, I'm grieving it. And now I'm going to have to find something uh, my new plan for finding new attachments and new bonds and new yeah. relationships. Yeah. And my own self-talk goes from the thinking that I am this thing to being like, okay, baby, what do you need? Like, what's going on here? Like, okay, I've got big feelings. I'm not going to try and talk you out of it. What do you need to get through this? Do you need a blanket? Do you need a hug? Do you need something to eat? Like, what do you need, baby? And then my process goes from, you know, like being this like loving kind of guardian to being able to stand up in that and be the adult again. So that's how my process works. And it's like, how do you parent the inner child without like scarring them, you know, without making it harder, without like having creating wounds that you have to then recover from, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big part of my work in somatics is um, especially as a dancer and performer is that so much of the work can be re-traumatizing. Yeah. If it's not coupled with, for me, it is, it has to be coupled with others so that I don't keep inflicting self-harm Yes. in, in my own, that's my groove of self-destruction that comes up there because as a classical trained ballet dancer, that was how um, my teachers got me to perform for them. Mm. So the self-critical self-shame thing would come up. And so, you know, I'm always working me personally on uh, finding the balance or leveraging. For me, it really comes about time. That's something that I'm very keen on um, is like how much time I'm allowing myself to stay in some place without nudging it just a little bit in a new direction. 
Yeah. So um, I said eating sweets. It sounds to me like you were saying, asking your inner child, what do I need? Yep. And so I'll say that um, the next thing that helps me find relief and about a year ago when I was going through it, um, I think you may have given me this suggestion. If not, um, it's something that came up as a result of our conversation. And now it is in my weekly practice, which is um, setting a timer to allow myself to uh, what I call messy cry. Mm -hmm. So I go to nature and I'll set the timer on my phone for 10 minutes. And I think to myself, oh, there's no way I'll be able to stop in 10 minutes. But if I really let myself get messy, I'm always done before 10 minutes is up. My body yep. actually cannot handle crying, messily, sobbing, all of that for 10 minutes. Usually within five or six minutes, I will, it will naturally pull itself back together and there'll be this little like double or triple sigh that happens. It's automatic. And then I'm like, oh, it's done. Mm -hmm. Like I may still feel grief, but the messiness of it, the acuteness of it has passed. Mm -hmm. But I still let that 10 minutes be there. And if there's time left over, then I'm staying with that grief feeling so that by the time the 10 minutes is over, I can't wait to move my body or take a new shape or go for a walk or go do some other activity. So setting a timer and messy crying is my next one. <laughs> nice. I like it. Uh, that was not my suggestion. It's not one of my practices, but I like it. Yeah. Um, one of mine is, um, is giving myself the spaciousness, which is very similar. It's, it's like, okay, nothing needs to get done right now. Here we are. This is what's coming up to be cleared and witnessing it like a volcano. You know, like whatever's being stimulated, witnessing the eruption of it, not judging what comes up, not judging what comes out, just allowing the, the eruption. And then if, you know, sometimes after a volcano erupts, there's some cleanup to do. So, you know, totally. yeah. That may have been uh, the part of the conversation that gave me the idea for the timer of messy crying was this allowing the volcano, you know. You have to allow the volcano. If you try and put a lid on it, you end up with fermented ick. It's not good. <laughs> yeah. Fermented stuck ick that's being held by a shallow breath. Yeah. Great. Well, the next one I'm going to say is altar building. Mm. Um, so I think um, just after speaking to so many people who are going through the grieving process, I used to teach. Um, uh, it was a class, but it was long. So we called it a workshop every week that was called Yoga for the Grieving. Mm. And um, we would set an altar of intention with each other. And so everyone at the beginning of class was to bring something that was a symbol of their grief. And um, I learned by talking to so many clients about this process that there seems to be this, I don't personally experience this, but it has come up enough that I want to make mention of it and couple it with this altar building where folks tend to um, have a shame for moving on. Like if someone has died or a situation has passed and, and, and I think this also is enculturated that if someone is not bothered terribly by something that they are perceived as not having empathy or emotion or being selfish or being cold or and and healing is non-linear and so I have found um, that altar building with my community in this way um, really continued to allow people to to of the if everything is this piece of the pie to segment this part of memory and honor um, to the loved one or situation or experience that they are grieving that is gone, but still hold it in their memory with reverence. And by the end, when we go to pick up our totem, um, we're finding something to be grateful for in the loss of that by noticing, oh, with the loss of this, this thing happened in my life. Or with the loss of this, I've been able to discover this about myself. Or this door opened because that one closed. Or um, for me, it's often now that they're gone, they're with me more than they ever were before. But that's just um, someone who's very um, 
who does a lot of practice in the unseen forces at play. And since my near-death experiences have a seemingly like a, um, an intuitive bubble around me that's able to slurp from the unseen things that are there. I cannot go so far as to claim that I know that beings who are not in their body are all around us. It may just be that their memory is accessing things in my own consciousness that widen it. Um, but I can hear loved ones' voices as if it's in you know now real time and carry on conversations with them more than when I when they. They were still in the flesh and I perceived this limiting factor to them. Um, so often when I go to pick up my totem or then at home in my altar um, for the, you know, those that have I've recently lost, a, um, a token of memory has each been placed. And when I sit down to light my incense in the morning, I'm remembering each one of these or lighting the candle for them. Um, and then when I blow out the candle or, you know, the incense or it's just time for me to get up, even if it's 30 seconds that I'm spending at my altar, then I'm finding something to be grateful for, for either, either one of these beings or the path that it's excavating in me currently as I go through the process of releasing my pain over the, the loss of them. Yeah, I love that, that's beautiful. So altar building is my, my next one. Do you have any more? Yeah, um, especially with men that were like kind of like father figures for me, I always want to wear a piece of their clothing. When my dad mm. died, um, he, he, I had inherited his hat that had actually belonged to my grandfather. Um, I just recently got some of my grandfather's shirts and my dear friend Will that died um, last year, which is still, or earlier this year actually, um, I have one of his shirts and uh, yeah. That, that helps me is just um, feeling like they're hugging me while I'm mm -hmm. just like processing, that they're holding me while I'm processing, you know, the repatterning. Yeah. Which takes me right into my next one, which is um, I know for some a weighted blanket works mm. and in general for anxiety, but it can also call, it can also help in the grief process to feel like a hug. The weighted blanket does not work for me, but what does work for me is if I'm near an ocean, I will completely bury myself in the sand mm. and pretend that they are the ones that is close to me. And it feels like we're in there together and no one can disturb us or mm. bother us. Um, you know, just a note on that. If you choose to do it, make sure that there's things around you that other people don't step on. Because one, one time I did this when I was in Florida and I buried myself a little too well. And some children came running across me and actually stepped on my stomach as they went across. And I Aww. was like, oh, I don't know if I should do this anymore because that was kind of painful. But yeah. I've just learned to like, you know, use my things to barricade around me so that people don't run through the center of it. But for me, that, that feeling like they're cloaked that I'm cloaked in them yeah, or cloaked in the experience. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of like shutting a everything down. Exactly. That. Yeah. yeah. Cocooning. Yeah. And that's part of like the whole process is that, you know, caterpillars go into a cocoon and absolutely turn to goo and remake themselves into something new. And when we are letting go of the attachment that we had to having that person or a thing or whatever be part of our identity, we need to go through a cocooning process for sure. So yeah, yep. Totally. Um, I just have one more and I'm also checking the time and seeing like, oh, I need to get going back to You've been going soon. for a while, yeah. Um, so I just had a couple of more, um, well, in, in, in reference to this burying yourself in sand, just taking Shavasana can also do the same thing. And um, those who are, you know, not familiar. Sorry, just trying to get my light right here. I, I so, love how, how godly it looked, actually. That was pretty cool. <laughs> um, the, the idea of practicing death for oneself while in the state of grief seems like it is unmag unimaginable to broach, like it will cause too much grief. And oftentimes my, my, clients and students in yoga, um, after I talk them through a deep relaxation, a natural grief will come up. And, and so often they'll say, I don't even know why I'm crying. And I say, perfect, because we don't even need to name it 
Grief is present because a part of our identity is in the process of releasing pain. So the tears are the purification process of releasing that pain. And then last be, lastly, but definitely um, not last in the priority of things, I actually tend to go to this one first, is um, dancing, sweating our prayers, dancing to sad songs, moving our body and encouraging the process of the purification. So if I dance to a happy song to try to avoid or change the emotion, um, it rarely happens successfully. But if I allow myself to play, um, like with my ex-husband, it was all of our songs together or songs that reminded me of him that I played to, that without even my permission, the tears and the grief would come and I would make myself keep moving through that. I wasn't even paying attention to the movements I was doing or tracking them or notating or any of those things in the beginning, but simply letting myself be an animal in its release, um, much the way that we talked about being a child might have a temper tantrum and then get it out of its system. So uh, I just want to remind my future self that it's okay to dance pain, yeah, dance emotional pain. And my and my similar thing to that, this body doesn't doesn't do dance the way that yours does, but I do sing. And so mm. when my my dad died, I just there was a song that just reminded me of him. It's called Hat Full of Stars, and uh, that hat I would just put that hat on, and there's a line about putting this hat on my head, and I would just. I would just, I would twirl, I guess, as dancing, and I would just sing the song. And uh, I still sing it to release grief. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, singing, I, I didn't put that in my list, but I absolutely um, put myself back in my guitar. And um, I teach so frequently that my voice is often hoarse, so I wasn't really able to sing, but playing music in general. Um, yeah. You know, it's that, the movement. Yeah of going moves through energy. the process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anything that moves energy will help move grief. Absolutely. Anything. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What, do we have any loose ends to tie up? Oh, I would just say I can feel the presence of others who may be watching this in the future. And I want to speak to that audience by saying that, um, I've spoken a lot about needing others. And so I thank you for joining us today because we may be the only others that you're entrusting with this mucky muck, sticky, ooey, um, negative emotion process. And, um, and I also want to encourage us and others to continue to um, develop relationships and take a chance on others. Um, find a friend that we can take a chance on to really spill our guts to and, um, and know that we're not alone in this life and we're not meant to go through the experience alone. It's, no one is going to give anyone else an award for doing it by yourself. Um, but we do stand to um, receive the benefit of reward by going through the process with others and entrusting them to see deeper into ourselves. It actually is a great honor to someone else to say, I have this thing that I need your help with. And it's a great gift to others to um, test that space out. So yeah, I just, that feels like I'm complete now by saying that part. Yeah. I feel like I guess one of the things I want to touch on is that, you know, there's this, um, this, this thought about loving like you've never been hurt. And I think maybe a more helpful thing is to love like you actually have the set and setting to recover from that hurt. Like, mm. you know, cultivate a life such that you can be as hurt as hurt is and, and survive it that, you know, you have given yourself the spaciousness to do the set, to do the work to, you know, that you have the tools that you have, you know, ways that aren't full of harm to move through something like that. And I think the reason that people block themselves off from the experience of bonding like that is because they don't have that experience. So I think because we've been through what we've been through, we can love more freely because we know it's not gonna kill us. Yeah. Yeah, that. Amen. Yeah. I love you. 
I love you too. <laughs> Thank you I'm so, so much. I'm so glad we're alive at the same time. This is so mm -hmm. cool. You're one of the coolest people I know. You've been through so much and you have so much grace and mm -hmm. so much brilliance. Thank you for reflecting that beauty back to me. Yeah, I feel exactly the same way about you. And it's just, um, I feel so lucky mm -hmm. to co-navigate life beside you. Mm -hmm. This has been lovely. Indeed. Yeah. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.